Star Wars has become a multimedia franchise that really needs no introduction in a video about Star Wars. Given how successful the original trilogy of movies are, it comes as no surprise that licensed video games were made to capitalize on the film's success, and Atari Incorporated was no exception, because in 1983, they released what was simply called Star Wars for arcades all over North America, and it was a success not just for having the name Star Wars on the cabinet, although that might have had something to do with it, but given how even to this day it's still seen as an arcade classic, there must be something about it that keeps people coming back for more. Hello everyone, Alec Alger the SideQuest Gamer after a few weeks hiatus, but I'm here to ask the big question. The Star Wars for the arcade still holds up after 35 years? Well, let's find out. Before True 3D was possible, the closest thing back then in arcades were vector lines that gave the illusion of 3D. Development began in 1981 as a game simply called Warp Speed, with Ed Rotberg at the helm. If you don't know who that is, he's known for making the vector line battle zone game, where you control a tank fighting against other tanks and enemies of that sort, but he later left Atari in October of that year to form his own development company, and later Atari made a deal with Lucasfilm for the rights to make a Star Wars arcade game and the rest is history. Now, I do feel the need to disclose that this review isn't straight out of the arcade machine because unless I'm the heir to the long lost royal family fortune to some European nation that no longer exists, I can't afford a machine and I don't even have room for it. I mean, look at my room, it's so small. You think I can just fit an entire Star Wars arcade cabinet in this one room? <laughs> You're joking. So while these games are not on exact original hardware, you know, it's close enough. It's on the Star Wars Rebel Strike game for the GameCube. And to be perfectly honest, that's probably the version people my age have played. The game starts with a score screen on display, and if you wait a minute, it does bring you up to speed on the story of the game, in case you're one of the few uncultured swines that never saw the movie. I kid, I kid, but seriously, if you have not seen the Star Wars movies, what the heck are you waiting for? Like, you can go on Amazon.com and just rent them for a few bucks. If you're that skeptical of them, like, come on, it's only like a few hours. Can you sacrifice like two hours of your life just watching Star Wars and seeing what all the fuss is about? You don't have to see Rogue One or the sequel trilogy movies or even the prequel trilogy movies, just the original trilogy movies or at the very least, the first one. Okay, rant over, back to the review. Now, for those who have not seen Star Wars, to which this game is loosely based off of, more specifically the Battle of Yavin where the Rebels launch an assault on the Death Star owned by the Imperials, but the text wouldn't really tell you all of that, and only tell you that some guy named Ben Kenobi is gone, but his presence can be felt with the Force. Who is Ben Kenobi, and what is this thing called the Force? The game wouldn't really tell you, but the ending sentence does imply that the Force is some spiritual power, and it also succeeds in telling you the Empire's Death Star under the command of Darth Vader, which is headed to the Rebel planet, and you, the player, must join the Rebels to stop the Empire. It's pretty much a basic good versus evil premise, but given something as ominous as the Death Star, the name does imply the station is up to no good, and for that, the story text does enough to give the player a reason to play it. However, from the perspective of a Star Wars fan like myself, there is some continuity errors I couldn't help but notice. For one, the Death Star is not under the command of Darth Vader, but instead Grand Moff Tarkin. Darth Vader was nothing more than a goon for the Emperor, while Grand Moff Tarkin had the real power over the Death Star. But other than that, there's not really anything I can complain about. And after that intro text, the red text does tell you how to play the game, which basically amounts to shooting the targets, where to hit certain targets, avoid getting hit by the projectiles, or risk losing deflector shield points. It's basically an on-rail shooter in the first person perspective, where you control Red 5's X-Wing through an onslaught of enemies and obstacles. The thing that's neat about this arcade game is that you can actually select the difficulty level of the game between easy, medium, and hard, with higher difficulties even rewarding you with point bonuses for selecting said difficulty, and that is quite admirable so veterans of this game who want to compete against one another won't have their first game be a spoon-fed victory, while noobs can comfortably learn to play the game until they're at a veteran level of skill. 
And getting into the gameplay itself, the first wave just has a bunch of TIE fighters firing projectiles at you, with a Death Star off in the distance indicating that's where you're going to go, giving this game a sense of journey. Regardless, the TIE fighters don't get dangerous at the start, but do progressively get harder to hit and come in larger numbers the closer you are to the Death Star. And let me tell you just how satisfying it is to see the TIE fighters blown apart with tumbling wings flying around in space after you hit one of them. That's just awesome! And the red and white blinking projectiles just gives off this menacing, uncomfortable feeling as it approaches you, getting closer and closer, and it just goes to show how much effort was put into the presentation of this Vector Line game. All these things in combination just add up to this sense of feeling like you're in a dogfight with very high stakes. You're outnumbered, so what are you, the hero, going to do about it? And then you're in the trench itself with now turrets shooting projectiles at you, and the moment you've waited for, the exhaust port, and just hitting that flashing exhaust port at the end results in the Death Star blowing up and the Rebellion is saved. Wait, that's not all there is to it. Because after you blow up the Death Star, the game loops like an arcade game is designed to do and get progressively harder and harder until you eventually die. But that was just the easy mode. After looping, this game adds additional waves and even more obstacles, like more TIE Fighters in the beginning, and connection points you have to fly over and under in the trench run, but more specifically, an additional wave where you can avoid fireballs while taking out these red buildings, and after blowing up the Death Star a second time and going through another loop, that wave will now have towers you have to fire at or avoid. And honestly, this just might be my favorite wave because of how much freedom the player has when approaching the trench, and just how heck and dangerous it can be. This is the point where I grew to have a massive appreciation for this arcade game because while the destructible fireballs were not exactly in the movie, it does pay homage to the film it's based off of and goes beyond what any other licensed arcade game tries to go for. And overall, this 1983 Vectorline arcade game still holds up 35 years later and I personally would rank it as a good game. This game has honest to god passion put into it, and while the vector line graphics may turn off some, I think they add some charm to it, where you can actually tell where you are in relation to your enemy and environment. And the sound design was well done for its time, having voice clips from the movies in it, and while it sounds a bit compressed, I mean, it is 1983 sound hardware after all, it is clear enough to know what they are saying, and the roaring of the TIE fighters is quite the highlight, I must say. And as for the music, it's fine. I mean, it just takes a few measures from the iconic Star Wars scene playing over and over with some notes being extended. But the sound effects overpower the music to the point where I find myself paying more attention to it than the music itself. And the controls are fine for the most part, but I wouldn't really say the handling of the X-Wing is as smooth as, say, controlling an X-Wing in Star Wars Rogue Squadron, which I felt handled much better. But 35 years later, there's surprisingly not much to complain about with this arcade game, and I can see why it is revered as a classic arcade game from the 1980s that you must play before you die. With the Death Star destroyed and this game finally reviewed and given coverage on this website, I will go to the ceremony and collect my medal. But until next episode, thank you all so much for watching and may the force be with you. Jeez, I forgot. I gotta review Empire Strikes Back next episode.